once again, Joe Speak Podcast. First of all, I got to say, I'm excited because we actually have the camera up. I didn't know that you guys would get to catch my Run DMC sweatshirt, but that's always important. In any event, um, I digress. But today, I've got another great show. I've got Eric Woolridge of American Veteran, um, who is doing some very incredible things uh, here in our community. And so, uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, thrilled to have you here. We are guest driven, my friend. And so let's talk first, you know, always on my shows, try to build, the, build the house okay. and let's talk about where the expertise comes from, where the passion comes from, and we'll get into some other things. So give us some information about your background and uh, how you came to this point in terms of the things that you're doing now and get us at the doorstep of the work you're doing. Okay. Um, my name is Eric Woolrich and I'm 54 years old. Um, basically, American Veteran came about because being a veteran, when I first got out of the military in the, the late 80s, uh, I had business ambitions, and I went to every bank, and um, I was just murdered by every bank, like, no, 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 no. You know, that's the old adage. Thanks you know? for your service. Thank you, but no. no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm a person that doesn't believe in giving up, and I just started reinventing myself. Right. But I quickly learned that being employed by others wasn't right. the path that I wanted to go. Right. So I decided to start, you know, opening businesses. And I opened up a, a business called Team One Stop. It was a drug and alcohol outpatient center. Wow. It was an amazing run. I did it for 10 years. Right. And then we had this uh, governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay. Yeah. Who came in and tried to balance our budget that was really out of control at that time. Sure. And he cut every mode of funding that I was funding under. Mm. And I had 20, 23 plus employees. Wow. And I decided that everyone needed to get a severance package. Right. So as I did that, I became um, bankrupt. Mm. And mm. I was just like, this is horrible. Right. And then subsequently, my son got killed in a motorcycle accident. Lord have mercy. So Gosh. when I look at it, it was similar to look like the book of Job. And when everything happened, it happened. Yes, sir. And I became homeless. Right. And I turned to the VA because I'm, I'm a veteran. Right. Um, and they said no because mm. I didn't have a drug problem. I didn't have a mental health problem. So I started learning the VA system. Right. And in the VA system, I learned that it was something, I, I don't want to use racism, but right. the practices were a little different Sure, you know, for different people, you know, brown people, black people. It was like different spectrums of help. Sure. So I started helping people. Right. And, I, and I learned through helping that we have a whole segment of people right. who need help, right. who are not being helped. Sure. So when you look at the homeless rate, 23 veterans a day commit suicide mm. nationwide. Wow. And that's alarming. Right. And there are people who, who look like me and you, who right. look like our, our brothers who are tribalistic. You know, and it's like, this is pretty sad. Yes. So I start turning to different veteran organizations and they start having different missions. So one night I'm just thinking like, I really need to do something about this. Right. So I turned to an organization in Los Angeles. Um, I'm forgetting the name right now. Right. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. Right, sure. Uh, they located in Inglewood. Amer um, I keep saying American veteran. I'm so used to saying American veteran. Right, because that's your organization. Yeah, but um, it was, um, ooh, I forget the name. But they, they, they helped me. They housed me. They helped me get a, um, a HUD badge voucher, which is Section 8 for, for veterans. Sure. sure. And, and I used it for what it was intended to. I got back on my feet and I gave it back because at the time, right. I didn't want to use something that someone else can use. And right. Benefit for. right. So, so you weren't interested in stepping into that other, that other category and cycle and staying there. Exactly. Right. I want to make a difference. So um, while I was there, I was in school finishing up my bachelor's. Then I got accepted to USC. Right. And I went to USC, graduated with a master's in um, social work. Right. Sure. And uh, after I did that, I was in a five-year program for my PsyD. Right. And at the time, I was just like so overwhelmed that my mother passed. And I was just, it was just raining and pouring. Sure. So um, I dropped out of a, the PsyD program. And just started working, taking care of my mom, who subsequently passed away. Mm. And while I was in the waiting room one day, I seen some veterans in there. And they were sleeping because it was warm. Right. And the hospital staff was so insensitive. Right. 
right. and they kicked them out. That moment, I said, you know what? I'm going to start a nonprofit, and my primary focus was going to be housing veterans. Right. So as the plan evolved, it just grew, sure, and grew and grew. So now, what American Veteran is today, we're we're building a facility made out of shipping containers and modular units right. where we're going to give housing away free to veterans right. and we're going to create our own income streams through employment right. you know, building our base by getting jobs from the city um, different private sectors who will get tax credits for hiring veterans homeless veterans right so i uh, moved out this way two years ago and really found out it's a lot of politics in raw land Sure. So, right. Yeah. You figure there's yeah. all this property. All so, this hey, hey, you know, it'd be great. You just slide right in here. Like, oh, no. Um. Exactly. <laughs> but it's been a great learning curve because I'm not one easily deterred. Right. For sure. And I found land and I'm, I'm in the process of making this happen because at the end of the day, if you raise your right hand to protect this country from tyranny. Right. You deserve help. Yeah. Not to, right. not to be marginalized or exploit it because a lot of these companies they they help veterans but they make a tremendous amount of money off of helping veterans right and i don't see that as helping veterans and now interestingly you have found a way to make your day-to-day work Mm -hmm. be connected to veterans as well even while you're doing the nonprofit. am i right about that you're correct okay so tell us about that uh, I'm I'm a substance use disorder social worker for Department of Veteran Affairs. Right. So that's what I do. To all my salary goes into my business. Right. And I fundraise by uh, selling furniture and things that are donated to generate income wow. for the business. So it's it's been kind of slowed down since COVID. So I, I've had to pivot. Right. So what I'm doing now is I'm I'm starting a new business mm-hmm. where we're going to use that business as a funding source for right. um, for our project. Wow, exactly. Man, that's crazy. So give us the 30,000 foot view about what you see in terms of one of the things that I'm doing is I want to make this show a part of a series uh, that talks about where we go now. Okay. What are the practical things that people on the ground see that needs to be done? So for leaders on every level, state, local, national, we've got a new, you know, and I'll tell you, I have an affinity for Veterans Affairs, not because I was a veteran, but because my mom worked for Veterans Affairs for 40 years. Mm. My dad was 100% service-connected disabled vet. So um, my mom's whole career was about helping veterans. And there would be times that it would be like like a fraternity brother or something. They were they were missing something um, but, but related to their dad who passed when they were young or whatever else. And she was able to kind of help get get them through the paperwork and get from point A to point B. Because, man, I'm telling you, that's a big, yes, it is. That's a big forest, brother, if you don't know how to get through it. Yeah. So give us the 30,000-foot view on the gaps that you see in terms of what um, um, the veterans – and, and, and the organization, without you necessarily talking about your workplace per se, the things that we need to, to, to understand that we're missing and we need to do better. And that's awesome. That's actually an amazing question. Yeah. Because what I've seen is really missing is, is simple. It's just wraparound services. Right, gotcha. See, everyone vil- villainizes the VA. Right. And, and I did too once upon a time. Right. But being an employee now, what I see is that the money comes from the federal government, from Congress. Right. And then it gets dispersed, and it goes through a lot of different chains. Right. Uh, it's a clog in the middle because right. the middle guys are really scared of making a mistake because if you make a mistake, you go to jail. Right. Gotcha. So we, ha- we can house veterans, true enough. But you can house a veteran, but they don't get furniture. We have places that we depend on. They don't get new items. We get used items. And I'm like, mm-hmm. we're the VA. Where are the services? Like, we do have mental health. We do have um, primary Um, care, you know, Mm -hmm. from providers. Right. But it takes you anywhere from 90 to 120 days to get seen. So today, if you're, if you're getting high and you feel suicidal, it might take you 90 days to see someone. Man, that's nuts. You know, we have, we have hotlines, but it should be the old fashioned care where you can come in and see someone the day of. And it's not, and it's not the VA's fault, but it's just the the system is so clogged. Mm -hmm. And then we have contractors that, that get, contracts to help us but these organizations don't have the best practices right you know because it's about money right pretty much it's not about care for the veterans so when we look at wraparound services as a social worker i'm often going out to the community getting private sources 
mm-hmm. to help with the veterans to become right. non VA providers. Right. And even that's not enough. It's this problem is huge, especially right. with COVID. Now people are in the homes and they're feeling suicidal. Right. And you look around and you're like, oh my God. You know, and you look up, it was a mohill. Now it's a huge mountain. Right. So that's the number one problem is resources. Right. Is there also a problem with the VA that's emblematic of the whole um, aircraft carrier problem where they're just really big and it's just hard for them to change course even if they've got good intentions? Is it How nimble are they? Could they be more nimble in terms of, okay, here's a need, here's how we address it, and we can shift quickly to address it? You know what I mean? Like the pandemic has been something that, you know, you know anybody that, that that's a – you know, that's a big operation yeah. that's, not, that's not amenable to change and that can't change quickly, you know, is getting left behind. So have you seen kind of some of that, ways we can be more nimble that way? Well, it's, it's, that's difficult. Right. That's, that's the whole problem because the VA is a, a super large conglomerate. Right. So you just can't say, hey, guess what? We need to make a left right here. Right, sure. There's policies that need to go in effect. Right. The policies need to get ran by Congress, the Senate, the House. Right. And then that might take anywhere from six months to a year. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars being, you know, um, assigned to help a certain population. Right. But by the time the help actually gets there, that population is drowning now. Yeah, sure. So that's one of the biggest problems. Now. And, and it's not like they don't try. Right. But when you're that big, right, it has to be procedures. So right. I think if we could cut a lot of red tape. Right. It would be better, but that's virtually impossible as well. Mm -hmm. That's real difficult. Yeah. Tell me how, where, you know, we got to talking. It's really funny how, for as aligned as we are in terms of the types of things we're doing and the type of goals that we have, and we'll talk more about that or whatever else, you know, you meet in the most mundane places. I mean, I, I, I met this brother in front of Starbucks. You know what I mean? And we're sitting, talking. He Definitely. was talking with Joe and Cleo, who I, shout out to Joe and Cleo. Shout out. Who I talked to. They were there this morning, but I was on my way to Panera. So, you know, I was, I, I couldn't be loud about it because I don't want Starbucks to think I'm cheating on them. I wouldn't get in their, their sandwiches, you know. But in any event, you know, I don't want to, you know, hurt anybody's feelings. But um, for where we come from similar places, we got to yes. talking about it and, and that kind of thing. So talk about how your work with, uh, veterans and on behalf of veterans is connecting to your desire to address things that are going on on the social justice side? Another outstanding question. Um, One lesson that I've really learned is that racism plays a very pivotal role. And I'm not talking about traditional racism. I'm talking about systemic from everyone, including myself. You know, I got into this. I'm like, I'm going to help every black and brown veteran I can. And then I had to learn to not program that type of thinking because mm-hmm. help should be universal. Right, right. But as I sat back and I started deprogramming, right. I started looking at other organizations and right. people who are helping veterans. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a really large systemic thing. So starting there, right. you know, where people can realize that any man or woman, regardless of their sexual identity, right. deserve help because they put their life on the line to put to preserve our way of life. Right. And we're not going to get anywhere, Joe, because you have people who are here who are psychologists, who are social workers, who are peer support, and we have selfish motives to help veterans. But it's all about people who look like us. So I think sensitivity about really helping the whole veteran, no matter what color, especially the sexuality, that's something that's huge. So you've seen that. You saw that pretty big. How long were you in, in the military? Uh, I was in the military five years. Okay, right. I on. made the rank of sergeant, and then uh, I hurt my knee really bad, mm-hmm. and I, I was kind of forced to get out because I was kind of um, not mobile anymore. So right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% myself. Okay, gotcha. I understand. Yeah. So, and so, yeah, so you, so you really see that there's this need to help the whole veteran and help every veteran and not distinguish between one or the other. Tell me how... You know, they're talking now about, you know, of course, where the con- the country is it's really in what I think is a cultural war, and, and race has a lot to do with it. Mm-hmm. Tell me about how much or how little you saw um, race play out in the military, because right now what they're saying is, and I don't know this from experience, but in their investigation, they're saying that they're looking not only at police that potentially were 
connected to white supremacists or, or along that line or whatever else, but they're looking at military the same way. Definitely. How much did that play into to, to what you saw while you were there? 100%. Really? You know, everything was segregated. You mm -hmm. know, like, it depends on where you grew up. Like, if you, if you really look at it, and this is not to villainize one group. Sure. But if you're from a rural area and all you see is primarily an Anglo-Saxon base. That's right. That's all you know. That's right. But if you're from an urban area mm -hmm. and you grew up, you see people who are of color. Right. So most police officers in urban areas don't happen to look like you. Right. That's right. So, so bridging the understanding between these two group of people is often race related. Right. You know, like I, I watched a movie recently, American Skin. Okay. Yeah, I need to see that. Everybody keeps telling me I need to see it. Amazing movie. And the cop said something in the movie that was so prevalent. He said, this is the way we're trained. Mm. Mm. He's, so I watched that. And what I got from that is like, that's that's one of the problems right there. We need to know how they're trained. Mm -hmm. Because we, we all equate everything to hate and racism. But it's deeper. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, if you don't have any black neighbors, it's not really racist. Mm -hmm. We look at it like, oh, you're racist. But no, like, you have a different understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, if you watch the news and, and you see things that are sensationalized, like these particular group of people, they like to hear loud music, degrade women, mm -hmm. and you don't have that. Right. It's, it's another form of understanding. Right. And I try to bridge the gap because, like, between white and black, that's a really hot topic right now. Yeah. Because we're so fast to play the race card, but when I listen to them, let me correct that. When I listen to white people speak, mm -hmm. the first thing is like they say, I just don't look at color. Right. But from my perspective, that's difficult because that's all I've ever been judged by right. is skin For color. Sure. You say you're color brown, that colorblind, that means you leave everything where it is. And if I'm behind and I'm just right. I'm in trouble. Right. But I started listening. I'm like, right. wait a minute. That's real talk. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't see color because if you grew up in a neighborhood where everyone looks like you. You really don't have, have color. you don't have to see color. Right. So I think it's we, we need to have a um, better understanding. Like we need to have symposiums on understanding right. on the psychological effect. Because if you go into a neighbor, like if you're a black kid from an urban community and you go into a fresh air camp for the summer, and you see white kids and they're chasing chipmunks and stuff, and you're like they're crazy. Right. Yeah. We've never seen that in yeah. an urban community. For sure. So it's just about bridging under better understandings. Right. Instead of instead of seeing racism, we we throw racism out way too fast. Right, right, and it's real, but it starts with having discussions. Yeah, um, you know, racism we all know is very real, but it starts off with having discussions in terms of getting somebody's come from. Um, I say it all the time: how you see things depends on from where you sit. Exactly. And you know, we get taught that lesson early on. Um, you know, that safety is the primary thing, right? So you would tell your grandson, okay, don't go up to any strangers. Right. Because you're not old enough to figure out whether this stranger is a good stranger or a bad stranger, right? Exactly. And so later on, where theoretically he has the judgment and the capacity to figure that out, if he doesn't have to be around anybody that doesn't look like him, naturally people that don't look like him are going to make him feel less safe. Exactly. You're going to connect to what you're familiar with. Exactly. And so for people that are open to having conversations, now some people, they don't, they don't want to have no conversations. You know what I mean? Or they want to have conversations just to undermine the other person and to be more comfortable in their point of view. And you have to have the discernment to know which is which. Exactly. But for people that want to have those kind of conversations, we really have to be intentional about having them. So tell me about, tell us about, we had talked about this a little bit and really hadn't gone all the way there on it because I wanted to say that for some of this time, I go, you ask me to come meet with you. I come meet with you and you give me a vision mm -hmm. for a bus that you're going to use uh, to be basically a visual that's going to help people on social justice. Talk about that. Definitely. You know, today we live in a, a visual society, right. you know, where you, you see things happen right now. There's no lapse. You can, like when Kennedy was killed, we didn't get the real story. We didn't get to see it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. today with camera phones and technology, we get to see everything. So I, right. I got to thinking like, I'm going to put together a project right. where the people who are not represented, like I watched, I watched so many different news channels that, and they say so many different things on the same subject. Mm -hmm. But the people who are marginalized, 
I see a story occasionally, and we might get one minute, 30 seconds right. to tell a story. So my thing is I, I, I want to give a voice to those who don't have a voice. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a true social worker, so right. I, I advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves, right. not just veterans, but for people. You know, like during this, during this um, Trump era, a lot of um, older white people, baby boomers, were, were labeled as racist. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with that because mm-hmm. I met some really great baby boomers that when you have talks with them, right. we have a lot in common. Sure. But they were lumped into a group because they were Trump supporters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you never have to hear their side. Like, you never get to hear, like, do you, do you really hate this particular group of people? Right. You just assume. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when people hear marginalized, they just think maybe people of color. Right. But marginalized, it's a lot of people. Like, if you fall into, like, a a blue-collar worker, like, they have names like hillbillies. Right. You know, and it's like, you never get to hear their side. Mm -hmm. Except for when it serves a purpose. Like, I noticed some news channels use them during the insertion. Right. And you heard a part of a narrative. You didn't hear the the whole narrative. Sure. So, these are the things, like, if we're going to say as a black person, I want to be heard. We have to hear right. other people as well. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing that I want to kind of promote with this project. I want to give, I don't have to agree with everything that people say right. because I'm not, Yeah. but I, but as part of asking somebody to hear me, you have to be able to listen. Right. And that's the whole thing with this project. We're going to give people a voice, even people we don't agree with that's right. and let the people, the American people hear it. And then they make the decision. Right. We're right. just going to be a, a street reporter. Right. And so you said that you were going to put like visuals on the bus where people could kind of see different things. Talk yeah. about that. Well, instead of villainizing certain groups, once again, right. I just want to tell the story of what happened in 2020. Right. You know, what led me to this idea, because I don't want to like like I have a lot of friends who are Hispanic mm-hmm. and DACA and ICE mm-hmm. are extremely important subjects. Right. For sure. And it's like to see a kid in a cage. Yeah, it's nuts. That's nuts. For yeah. in, in 2020 in America. Mm-hmm. And then to see these forest fires and how people's lives were just turned upside down. Mm-hmm. So everything that we're talking about is just how can we talk to get better? Right. Let's talk. Because, you know, mental health, everyone is suffering from mental health. Mm-hmm. So let's not digress. Right. Right. Let's progress. Right. Let's, let's have hard talks. Yeah. But let's, sure. have, let's have hard talks with some type of sustainability where we can just be honest and open right. without being labeled. Right. And that's the purpose. We want to put it out there. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, let's see how you feel about it. Right. But if you, if you're going to tell it, well, yeah, I hate this particular race. Why? And how can we bridge that gap? Yeah. See, people don't want to talk about that part. Mm-hmm. You, you we want to talk about the hate. Mm-hmm. Oh, this person robbed my mom. That mm-hmm. was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, let's talk about how can we get you to stop hating this particular race. Right. And empower each other so we can make this country great, great again in a real way. Mm-hmm. You know, like where everyone can have a say and a seat at the table. Right. So that's important. You've got, so you've got these um, projects and these passions that are converging and mm-hmm. coming together. Talk to the person that is not a veteran, mm-hmm. um, but here's what you're saying and they want to understand where they might fit in. How does somebody out there help? your mission and what you're trying to do if they're listening and they're um, affected enough to say, I want to do something. Great question. Um, I think by taking your time and doing the research, like my company is transparent. We're registered with the department of justice mm-hmm. and we're currently in good standings. Right. And it's American veteran dot org. Um, no, it's uh, dot net. American veteran dot net. Okay. Cause someone had the name is, um, you gotta. You have to unfortunately do the whole thing. H T P P S. Right. With the call of www.americanveteran.net, and yeah. then, you know, look at the materials just on the page. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not saying, hey, give us money, give us money. We we're trying to purchase land to build a facility. Mm-hmm. You know, because I don't want to say, hey, the VA is crap, because that's not true. Right. But I want to be something in addition to the VA. Like, hey, right. if the VA can help you, hey, come here, because right. our whole thing is housing you retraining you, helping right. you with me- mental health, and then wellness. Because yeah. wellness is so overlooked today because when you look at what's going on, if you if you have PTSD and people tell you, hey, you were in the war like seven years, get over it. Right. How, how do you do that? Right, yeah. How do you get over seeing someone explode? Right. 
time. Yeah. Or disintegrate. How do you get over that? Mm-hmm. You know, that's why people self medicate. You know, you, you know, when you look in our brochure, we have we have statistics. Mm-hmm. You know, really up to date statistics because most people don't understand that when you see a veteran who's getting high or drinking, they're self medicating because one, they don't have medical where they can go speak to the proper clinicians to help them. Mm-hmm. So they're self medicating. Right. Now, am I advocating for that? No. But can I judge that? You know, if a bottle of liquor will help you forget temporarily, that's what they, they're going to do. Right. But they, we need to have alternatives. We need to have better resources, wraparound services. Right. And that's what we're trying to do. So if the average Joe would like to help us, yeah. you know, donate so we can buy land, so right. we can make a difference. Sure. Come volunteer. Come get in contact with us. Get on our website and say, hey, listen, my name is so-and-so. Give me more information. Right. Talk to us. Get to know us. You know, we're not just in it for the money. Yeah. But money does make the world go round. Yeah, for sure. No romance without finance, like I like to say. Exactly. So finally, let I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, I'm really excited about some of the things that we've talked about doing together. I mean, I actually see us going out together. I mean, we actually have exactly. a mobile bus that allows people to um, to meet with us that where they don't have to come to our office, to our law office. And That's amazing. I can see us all putting something together, having discussions, signing people up for things, getting people information. I mean, I could really see a lot of this going. But tell me about, uh, in closing, the things that you have seen that make you optimistic. Wow, that's an amazing question. Well, when I look at, I'm a very visual person. Yeah. So when I see pictures of white, young white Americans holding up signs that says black lives matter. Right. I'm just done yeah. Yeah. because that's so amazing yeah. with, with this hate, this cloud of hate that we're under. Sure. When I see young Hispanic people and black people and white people together partying pre COVID, yes, sir. it's, I say, okay, we, we still have a chance because yeah. hate, the only thing that's going to ever break hate is fostering love that's right. and everything has to be more, Love based, yes. you know, st- stop hating. How do you get people to stop hating? Come together, talk, mm-hmm. discuss things. And kids, like, I, I, I hate being the black friend, right? You know, I want to ask you this question, but I don't know how to ask it. But since you're my friend, my, my right. black friend, right? Yeah, for sure. I don't like that because it's like, if you want to ask me a question, ask me uh, as a human, right? Okay, that happens to be a man of color, and mm-hmm. we'll discuss it because mm-hmm. I don't blame slavery on white people either, it's mm-hmm. just. This is so much deeper. Yeah. We have to turn down all the negativity yeah, right. and get back to the basis of healing. That's right. That's, that, that's my take. That's huge. Eric Woolridge, listen, go to American Veteran HTTP uh, colon forward slash forward slash uh, American Veteran dot net. Right. That's right. And uh, check out this man's organization. Um, you know, as you're connecting to me on the Joe Speak podcast, you know, you can always holler at me about him to get con- get in contact. If so, but look for us. We're, we're going to be collaborating on some things coming up. So, Eric Woolridge, I really appreciate you coming and making our day, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your service then, now, and in the future. Thank you, sir. All right. Cool. All right. Joe Speak podcast. That's it.